Hello and welcome to tonight's book reading session of Preparing for the Day After. Preparing for the Day After is a picture e-book uh, and a photojournalistic treatise on disaster mitigation published by me, Malini Shankar and Walter Keller for the 10th anniversary of the Asian Tsunami. Tonight we will start with the chapter on uh, blizzards in the chapter Hydrometeorological Disasters, chapter 22, in the day and age of climate change. Understanding El Nino induced natural calamities, it is chapter 22 and uh, this is I think the second essay but let us first recap what we have learned in the previous book reading sessions before we start tonight's session. Water and sanitation is central to developmental discourse. Culture sensitive food security also has evolved out of local agrometeorological conditions prevalent in an area. Livelihoods based on local agrometeorological conditions are the best means of ensuring livelihood security. Climate change adaptation, menstrual hygiene especially for indigenous tribal women, solid waste management, unit universal healthcare access, sustainable development goals, they are all factors to be included in the development agenda. Media personnel have to be trained in reporting disaster preparedness or the lack of it at district level. Disaster is the impact of a calamity on the human landscape. This includes the impact on lives, livelihoods, livestock and landscape. Tonight we will start with a sub chapter on blizzards in hydrometeorological disasters in the day and age of climate change. According to the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric administration quote a blizzard means that the following conditions are expected to prevail for a minimum period of three hours or longer sustained wind or frequent gusts of 35 miles per hour or greater and considerable falling and or blowing of snow that is reducing visibility frequently to less than a quarter mile according to the government FEMA glossary which is going to the link of which is going to be put up in the description box below Inter in simple terms a blizzard is a snowstorm in wind Extreme cold spells characterized by heightened precipitation in a relatively short period of time, typically lasting a few hours, herald snowstorms called blizzards. High speed winds with gusts of blighting cold air caused by freezing conditions at the out onset of winter occur usually from December to February and sometimes as late as first week of March in the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, blizzards occur between June to August and sometimes as late as the first week of September. Hence, snowbound areas are more vulnerable to blizzards. The temperate zone latitudes of the northern hemisphere are prone to the blizzard-like conditions in December and last till February and sometimes till early March. Areas that suffer the last ice age are more prone to blizzards both on land and ocean. Polar cyclonic storms are similar to tropical cyclones. They have the same circular shape and bands of cloud. However, they strengthen faster travel faster at 56 kilometers per hour compared to 28 kilometers per hour for the tropical cyclones 35 miles per hour compared to 17 miles per hour and carry sleet and snow most antarctic snow storms occur in the winter when pressure differences are greater and the wind stronger a blizzard warning is issued for winter storms with sustained or frequent winds of 35 miles per hour or higher with considerable falling and or blowing snow that frequently reduces visibility to one fourth of a mile or less it is coming in terms of miles because it is a favor quantification federal emergency management of the air authority of the government of the united states these conditions are expected to prevail for a minimum minimum of three hours in the southern hemisphere cyclonic storm systems usually start in the middle latitudes and move gradually to the south bringing moisture and heat to the frigid antarctic continent most storms travel from the west to east under the influence of the pole of the polar westerlies and the coriolis effect the natural movement of is anti-clockwise in the southern hemisphere if i if i can remind you about that between 60 degrees south and 65 degrees south latitudes lies the antarctic circumpolar trough a zone of low pressure that contains variable winds flowing from west to east in this region fierce storms sweep warm moist air from the middle latitudes towards the pole causing floods clouds and precipitation storms usually last for a few days before a brief clearing then another storm system inland on the polar plateau the storms tend to dwindle as they lose energy although strong oceanic storms do occasionally create hazardous conditions on average a zone of high pressure exists over the central portion of the continent throughout much of the year resulting in lighter winds clearer days and extreme cold according to an article on this particular web link called the antarctic connection 
This link is going to be put up in the description box below. In the Northern Hemisphere, large parts of Russian Federation, Scandinavian countries, Arctic regions of Canada and Greenland are prone to blizzards. In Canada and Russia, lower altitudes also suffer from blizzards. In the subcontinent, that is in the Indian subcontinent, only the Himalayan regions are prone to blizzards. In Antarctica, as the temperatures decline in the fall, the continent cools rapidly. This results in large pressure differences at the edge of the landmass and leads to an increase in cyclonic or storm activity. The cyclones carry warmer, moisture air from the northern latitudes into the, subcon into the continent, though they often do not penetrate very far inland. Blizzards are typical Antarctic phenomenon occurring when the drift snow is picked up and blown along the surface by the violent winds. Bl blinding conditions can result in which objects less than three feet away may be invisible. Localized blizzards are caused when the surface wind sweeps up any loose snow even if the skies above are clear and no snow is falling. A severe blizzard may last for a week at a time with winds blasting at over 100 miles per hour. Drivers on the roads, shipping crew, airlines flying in the areas, indigenous people who may be outdoors during blizzards are vulnerable to blizzards. Essentially, anyone who is outdoors during a blizzard is vulnerable to instant frostbite, hypothermia and death. Caused by aggravated local precipitation, a snowstorm develops thanks to rapid fall in temperature in snowbound landscape. The effect usually lasts a few hours. Wildlife and people who are outdoors face the possibility of rapid hypothermia and death blows at the weak and vulnerable. Vehicles too spin around in blizzards and those caught in a vehicle in a blizzard are not too safe because heating infrastructure in vehicles are inadequate for blizzard conditions. In India, only the Himalayan terrain of Kashmir, Ladakh and the districts of Kelong, Lahore and Spiti in Himachal Pradesh are prone to blizzards. Early warning and forecasting are the lifeline for such vulnerable areas. Weather warnings are routinely broadcast on every news bulletin of All India Radio and Doordarshan in India. It emphasizes the need and the space there is for a weather channel for the subcontinent like in the USA. It can happen that blizzards span across Siberia, Mongolia, Western China, Tibet, Himalayas and into the Karakoram or the K2 range in Pakistan, Afghanistan and the former Soviet republics of Central Asia. All these regions are socio-economically backward, lacking resilience. Now here's a, a box item I have on blizzard fact. This is also from Antarctic Connection and the link. Bayot Station has blizzard conditions about 65% of the year. Blizzards often cause severe damage to buildings and can bury structures under many feet of drift snow. A blizzard is a storm with winds of at least 35 miles per hour and temperatures below 20 degrees Fahrenheit, which is sub-zero temperatures, with enough snow falling or moving snow to reduce visibility to less than a quarter mile. Eight or ten blizzards a year are not uncommon to coastal areas and they bring any human outdoor activity to a standstill. In the day and age of climate change, the impact and intensity of hydrometeorological disasters are, the only, are only going to increase given the unsustainable demographic curves of human development index in this day and age of inequities, I'm afraid. Well, CHCs, GHGs and chlorofluorocarbons, that is CFCs, are anthropogenic sources of emissions that accelerate precipitation. CHCs, GHGs, CFCs are the anthrop anthropogenic sources of emissions that accelerate precipitation and extreme temperatures in the normally mild tropics. But these extreme weather in the tropics have an impact on temperate zones too, where extreme weather conditions prevail. And with that, we have finished blizzards. Let us now move on to cyclone. According to information available in the on the official website of India's National Disaster Management Authority, quote, of India's 7,516 kilometers long coastline, close to 5,700 kilometers is prone to cyclones and tsunamis. Nearly 10% of the world's tropical cyclones strike these coasts. Of these, the majority of them have their initial genesis over the Bay of Bengal at the 10 degrees channel and strike the east coast of India, manifesting as cyclones during the northeast monsoons. On an average, Five to six tropical cyclones form every year, of which two to three could be severe. More cyclones occur in the Bay of Bengal than the Arabian Sea, and the ratio is approximately four is to one. Cyclones occur frequently on both the coasts, that is West Coast, that is Arabian Sea, and the East Coast, that is Bay of Bengal. An analysis of the frequency of cyclones on the East and West Coast of India between 1891 and 1990 
shows that nearly 262 cyclones occurred. 92 of these were severe in a 50 kilometer wide strip above the east coast. Less severe cyclonic activity has been noticed on the west coast where 33 cyclones occurred in the same period out of which 19 were severe. Tropical cyclones occur in the months of May, June and October, November. Cyclones of severe intensity and frequency in the North Indian Ocean are bimodal in character with their primary peak in November and secondary peak in May. The disaster potential is particularly high during landfall in the North Indian Ocean, which is the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea, due to the accompanying destructive winds, storm surges and torrential rainfall. Of these, storm surges cause the most damage as seawater inundates low-lying areas of coastal regions and causes heavy flooding, erodes beaches and embankments, destroys vegetation and reduces soil fertility. Cyclones vary in diameter from 50 to 320 kilometers, but their effects dominate thousands of square kilometers of ocean surface and the lower atmosphere. The perimeter may measure 1000 kilometers but the powerhouse is located within the 100 kilometer radius. Nearest the eye, winds may hit a speed of 320 kilometers. Thus, tropical cyclones characterized by destructive winds, torrential rainfall and storm surges disrupt normal life with the accompanying phenomena of floods due to the exceptional level of rainfall and storm surge inundation into inland areas. Cyclones are characterized Characterized by their devastating potential to damage structures, namely houses, lifeline, infrastructure, power and communication towers, hospitals, food storage facilities, roads, bridges, culverts, crops, etc. The most fatalities come from storm surges and the torrential rain flooding the lowland areas of coastal territories. Unquote. This is from the NDMA line uh, website and this link is going to be put up in the description box below. Around 74.85 million people around the Indian Ocean Rim countries and their hinterland are vulnerable to hydrometeorological disasters. The Indian Ocean Rim countries include Australia, Bangladesh, Comoros, Reunion Islands, Indonesia, India, Iran, Kenya, Madagascar, Malaysia, Maldives, Mauritius, Mozambique, Myanmar, Oman, Pakistan, Seychelles, Singapore, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Timor-Leste, Th Tanzania and Yemen have now put disaster risk reduction high on their political agenda. Given the potential increase in extreme weather events that trigger hydrometeorological disasters, it augurs for worthwhile investments, say experts. The 10 worst natural disasters of world history are encapsulated on this link below. I'm going to give, put up this link in the uh, description box below. Vulnerable populations like fisher folk, indigenous people suffer from livelihood insecurity, be it fishing in cyclone affected seas or cyclone affected agricultural lands where crop yield is affected because of salinity causing malnutrition. This can make them vulnerable to vector-borne diseases though through mutations of viruses that uh, host themselves on vulnerable human beings and livestock. The state of Odisha in India has more than five dozen indigenous peoples living in the hinterland lacking access to development and infrastructure. Calamities like Cyclone Phylon affect all equally but the tribes are far more vulnerable to the impact of calamities because of lesser resilience said Special Relief Commissioner Mr. P.K. Mohapatra, Indian Administrative Service Officer, uh, Government of Orissa, in, for an interview uh, for an article by me in Interpress News Service. This article is also going to be put up in the description box below. Coastal erosion in some areas like Balasore in the Indian state of Odisha and Nagapatnam in Tamil Nadu in the latter, that is uh, unsustainable salt mining, has considerably accentuated coastal erosion. The sea is making greater inroads into the hinterland in Tamil Nadu. In general, General quote, uh, in general, the coastal districts of West Bengal, Orissa, and Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu are more prone and are high in the and are in the high to very high category of vulnerability. The proneness factor is very high for the districts of Nellore, East Budavari, Srikakulam and Guntur in Andhra Pradesh, Balasore, Kendrapara, Bhadrak, Jagatsingpur and Ganjam in Orissa, Kanchipuram in Tamil Nadu and South 24 Paraganas and Midnapore in West Bengal are more vulnerable to cyclonic impact, says the NDMA's report called Development of Upgraded Hazard Pro Profile Map of India. Uh, a cyclone variety available on a particular link which is going to be put up here as well as in the description box below. 13 coastal states and union territories in the country are affected by tropical cyclones. Four states that is Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Orissa and West Bengal and one union territory that is Puducherry on the east coast 
of India and one state Gujarat on the west coast are more vulnerable to cyclone hazards. When sea surface temperatures increase, winds spiral to form a storm cloud like you see there. Traveling over the Bay of Bengal, the cyclonic storms behave like heat-seeking missiles before making landfall on flat coastal plains on India's east coast, terrorizing the coastal community. May, July in the Arabian Sea and October, November, December and sometimes January are the cyclone-prone months in the Bay of Bengal. Odisha's coast is vulnerable to cyclones that take birth off the west coast of peninsula Malaysia and travel in the Straits of Malacca, squeeze through the Strait of Sumatra between Sumatra and the Great Nicobar Island and head towards Odisha in October. Some cyclones spin into life in the 10 degrees channel that separates Andaman from Nicobar Islands in the Bay of Bengal. However, the cyclones in November traverse largely through the same latitudes and head to the coast of Andhra Pradesh, making landfall invariably on the intervening night between the 18th and the 19th of November every year. In no the November 1977 cyclone was the deadliest with 9,941 people who died, 900 people went missing and 34 lakhs were rendered homeless. Cattle and livestock losses stood at 2.5 lakhs. Crops were lost to the tune of 33,36,000 acres and 1,14,800 houses were damaged. Losses to the buildings and public property were estimated at 172 crores according to an official APDMA statistics. However, unofficial estimates of the death toll were 50,000. It is in the aftermath of natural calamities that the inadequate development quotient comes into sharp focus. Lack of water and sanitation in rural and coastal communities spell death knell for weak and vulnerable people. Lack of roads means logistical movement, especially for aid and relief, is impaired. Malnutrition amongst the indigenous people and the children can leave a very high toll among such vulnerable communities with nothing more than a prayer on their lips. The major impact of cyclones can be broadly categorized as under loss of lives, injuries and other health consequences such as epidemics and post-traumatic stress disorder, loss of habitat, loss of cattle and damage to crops and agricultural fields as well as to life livestock, damage to public utilities, disturbance and damage to the ecosystem. Most lives are lost accompanying cyclones. In case of severe cyclonic storms with storm surges, more than 90% of the fatalities occur due to drowning either during the incoming water phase or during the out surges. In severe cyclonic storms with, without storm surges, the deaths are more or less evenly divided between drowning and the collapse of buildings. The most common health problems include waterborne diseases such as diarrhea, dysentery, typhoid, viral hepatitis, respiratory diseases such as pneumonia and whooping cough, measles, gastroenteritis, cholera, conjectivitis and fever according to the official website of the Andhra Pradesh Disaster Management Authority which also states the state of Andhra Pradesh experienced 71 cyclones during 1892 to 1997 each time with colossal damage. Between 1892 and 1977, 56 cyclones affected the seven coastal districts. This uh, link is also, be going to, also be going to be put up in the description box below. The 1964 super cyclone over Rameshwaram in the Gulf of Manar ripped off the Pamban Rail Bridge. The Fisher Folk village of Dhanushkori was swallowed by the sea. Some of the factors responsible for vulnerability of the state of Andhra Pradesh to cyclone are almost half of the storms in the Bay of Bengal become severe cyclones often accompanied by storm surges. Low-lying areas along the coast are vulnerable to extensive flooding and deep inland sea water incursion. High concentration of population, infrastructure and economic activities along the coast. Lack of proper maintenance of the flood protection and irrigation systems, drains, embankments, etc. And lack of a comprehensive coastal zone and delta management. In the past four decades, major cyclones caused immense loss of human lives and livestock and massive damage to property, both of the government and the people. Namely, the November 1977 cyclone, May 1979 cyclone, November 1984, Orissa Super Cyclone of 1999, Cyclone Phylon of 2013, Chennai Super Cyclone of November 2015. Millions of people are at the mercy of cyclonic floods in the months of May, October, November and December, especially on the east coast of India, according to Indian Meteorological Department. Coastal, sorry, cyclones impair lives and livelihood security of the vulnerable com communities like fisher folk, coastal dwellers, indigenous people and livestock because they have the least resilience to natural calamity. The strong winds 
heavy rains and large storm surges associated with tropical cyclones are the factors that eventually lead to loss of life and property. Says the report, damaged potential of tropical cyclone prepared by India's Indian Meteorological Department. The link of this as well is going to be put up in the description box below. In the day and age of climate change, extreme temperatures cause you higher humidity and of consequently rainfall. On the other hand, oftener and usually unusual cold waves cause higher precipitation and snowfall. Increase in the sea surface temperatures perpetuated part partly by anthropogenic causes like increase in emissions and global warming accentuates cyclonic storms that pound the vulnerable areas. Rains, sometimes even more than 30 centimeters per 24 hours associated with cyclones are another source of damage. Unabated rains give rise to unprecedented floods. Rainwater on the top of storm surge may add to the fury of the storm. Rain is a serious problem for the people who become shelterless due to a cyclone. It creates problems in post-cyclone relief operations as well. On the infrastructure front, the most critical problem after passage of any tropical cyclone is the restoration of water distribution system. Strong winds along with the heavy rains accompanied with floods and storm surge associated with the cyclone devastate the critical parts of the power generation and distribution systems. Even the strongest port and the airport facilities, fuel and water storage tanks, high voltage transmission towers, etc. are vulnerable to damages says the IMD report, that is the Indian Meteorological Department report. Anthropogenic factors exacerbate glacial melt, consequently flash floods, crop crop loss, floods, landslides, mudslides, coastal erosion, coastal incursion, imbalanced international agricultural trade, insurance, infrastructure and thereby the economy are affected. Migration follows causing extreme socio-economic upheavals in the vulnerable sections of society and school dropout rates increase among children, having the most deleterious and serious impact on future generations. Consequently, political fallouts can impair policies on emission cuts and the whole cycle repeat. Apart from obvious consequences like the ones listed in the preceding paragraph, we have other consequences like indefinite power supply or power, power failure in the aftermath of cyclones, that is cyclone phylon, which caused communication hiccup. One disaster risk reduction activist in district, Mrs. Bina Pani Mishra told me in an interview, without power supply for two days after the cyclone made landfall, our cell phone, cell phone batteries are all near dead. She told me this in an article I wrote for about cyclone violence aftermath in the Interpress News Service, the link of which is going to be put up in the description box below. Lack of communication can be deleterious in disaster struck landscapes, obviously. With trees falling during cyclone, road clearance can affect logistics for search and rescue, movement of injured survivors to healthcare facilities etc. You can see in the picture below, I mean this is in the book reference not in this video, the enormity of trees falling in the aftermath of cyclone phylon in Odisha in October 2013. I think that picture is also going to come up in this video. In Bangladesh, sea level rise, constant flooding and cyclones have made the country very vulnerable to waterborne diseases like diarrhea and cholera epidemics. That has not only decreased the vulnerability of the population, is the vulnerability of the population, but has started has reduced the resilience and is very challenging in the day and age of climate change induced hydrometeorological disasters in the low lying uh, delta region of South Asia, that is Bangladesh. As population densities have increased, so have the hydro meteorological disasters. In India, the most destructive cyclones have been the 1891 super cyclone over Lakshadweep. The 1964-3 cyclone that pummeled almost all parts of the Indian coastline as it stretched from January to December 1963 instead of the usual cycle of May to November. The 1964 cyclone wiped off the fishing village of Danush Kodi in Rameshwaram Peninsula in Tamil Nadu, India off the face of the earth and ripped off the Pamban Railway Bridge which has since been reconstructed and is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The 1970 cyclone season battered both east and west coast of India and had extreme weather in all seasons. The 1971 cyclone in Odisha was considered the after effect of the extreme weather patterns of 1970. The summer of 1971 took a human toll in Goa thanks to the, its unusually humid nature. Logically, say geologists, high humidity is what causes higher than average rainfall and heavy monsoons. On these two Wikipedia links, which will be put up here as well as in the uh, description box below, uh, it gives us an insight into patterns, occurrence and impact of tropical cyclones in North Indian Ocean region that affect both the west and the east coasts of India.
original super cyclone in 1999 claimed 15,000 lives, 2.5 million heads of livestock and 90 million trees. Orissa's geography leaves it facing the Bay of Bengal. The flat coastal plain watered by the deltas of the rivers like Mahanadi, Baitarani, Banshadara, and Nagavalli make the terrain virtually receptacles to cyclonic storms. The flat coastal belt is vulnerable to soil erosion from the hills of the hinterland, making sea incursion a graver threat to coastal communities of Orissa. Increased heat and humidity create conditions for inevitable high, higher rainfall. Both increase in heat and humidity and increased rainfall have deleterious consequences on a largely rural, highly vulnerable populace in the tropics, like in India. Extreme weather events are only increasing as studies have shown in recent years. This calls for climate change adaptation. Mitigating social global warming can mitigate related hydrometeorological disasters like heat waves, famine, flash floods, floods, forest fire, fog, drought, desertification, mudslides, landslides, etc. The imperative climate change adaptation for humankind is to decrease emissions that contribute to global warming. If we don't, the marginalized vulnerable communities like fisher folk and the indigenous people will suffer more on account of loss of livelihoods and food insecurity thanks to us urban land lovers. Orissa attracts cyclones from the Bay of Bengal like heat-seeking missiles, said Mr. P. K. Mahapatra. The Indian Administrative Office Service Officer, the Relief Commissioner of the Government of Odisha. Uh, he, he said this to me in an exclusive interview for an article I wrote, a link of which is going to be put up in the description box below. Powerful cyclones, cyclones have battered Odisha like heat seeking missiles in 70 of the last 110 years, Mahapatra said. Substantiating this further, Prafula Ratha of Concern Worldwide told IPS for another article by me. And I quote him, the link of which is also going to be put up in the description box below. 49 of the last 100 years saw floods, 30 years were drought ridden, and 11 years faced cyclones. Giving just one example of livelihood insecurity, Ratha explained, one of the most vulnerable sections of society are the daily wage earners. Fearing loss of their daily wage, they defy safety precautions during heat wave or cold wave and continue working in the open. During summer day temperatures soar to 47 degrees centigrade when they expose themselves to heat, such heat and humidity in appalling working conditions. They succumb then to heat wave. Mala Reddy of the Action Pratana Ecology Center in Anandapur told me for a radio documentary, six out of ten years are drought ridden in Anandapur district of Andhra Pradesh. Building disaster resilience for such sections then includes alternate livelihood options, a safety net for income, health insurance, insurance against weather expenses. Employers too must be sensitized to making working conditions amenable in places with extreme weather. Long term climate change adaptation measures like watershed management, rainwater harvesting, soil conservation, catchment area conservation, wood lots, etc. have to be undertaken on a sustainable basis. It is not just life, livelihoods, livestock and landscape that are imperiled by natural calamities. The disaster the calamities leave in their wake include damage to infrastructure, trees, housing, water and sanitation, wildlife, power supply, crop loss, nutrition, the whole economy indeed. Damage to crop land accounts for loss of farm produce and agricultural livelihood leaving the vulnerable farming community even more vulnerable. Mass migration of labor force leads to surging school dropout rates and gender-based violence. Damage to water and sanitation infrastructure leaves women, children, frail and infirm vulnerable to disease. Preventing such complicated consequences is the goal of pre-calamity coordination, that is disaster risk reduction or resilience. It is very likely that there has been an overall decrease in the number of cold days and nights and an overall increase in the number of warm days and nights at the global scale that is for most land areas with sufficient data. It is likely that these changes have also occurred at the continental scale in North America, Europe and Australia. There is a medium confidence in a warming trend in daily temperature extremes in much of Asia. Confidence in observed trends in daily temperature extremes in Africa and South America generally varies from low to medium depending on the region. In many but not all regions over the globe with sufficient data, there is a medium confidence that the length or number of warm spells or heat waves has increased. There have been statistically significant trends in the number of heavy precipitation events in some regions. It is likely that most of that more of these regions have experienced increases than decreases, although there are strong regional and sub-regional variations in these trends. 
there is low confidence in any observed long term or 40 for 40 years or more increases in tropical cyclonic activity that is intensity frequency and duration after accounting for past changes in observing capabilities it is likely that there has been a poleward shift in the main northern and southern hemisphere extra tropical storm tracks there is low confidence in observed trends in small spatial scale phenomena such as tornadoes and hail because of data inequities and inadequacies in monitoring systems says the srx report that is managing the risks of extreme events and disasters to advance climate change adaptation extreme weather resilience calls for elaborate policy and infrastructure support economic including insured disaster losses associated with weather climate and geophysical events are higher in developed countries fatality rates and economic losses expressed as a proportion of gross domestic product are higher in developing countries that is high confidence. During the period 1970 to 2008, over 95% of deaths from natural disasters occurred in developing countries. Middle income countries with rapidly expanding asset bases have borne the largest burden. During the period from 2001 to 2006, losses amounted to about 1% of the GDP for middle income countries, while this ratio has been about 0.3% of the GDP for low income countries and less than 0.1% of the GDP for high income countries based on limited evidence in small exposed countries particularly small island developing states losses expressed as a percentage of the gdp have been particularly high exceeding one percent in many cases and eight percent in the most extreme cases averaged over both disaster and in non-disaster for the period from 1970 to 2010 says the srx report the srx report warns that extreme weather events are going to become more frequent in the 21st century and this climate change adaptations get political will from policy makers. Models project substantial warming in temperature extremes by the end of the 21st century. It is virtually certain that increases in the frequency and magnitude of warm daily temperature extremes and decreases in cold extremes will occur in the 21st century at the global scale. It is very likely that the length, frequency and or intensity of warm spells or heat waves will increase over most land areas. Based on the A1B and A2 emission scenarios, a 1 in 20 year hottest day is likely to become 1 in 2 year event by the end of the 21st century in most regions, except the high altitudes of the northern, northern hemisphere, where it is likely to become 1 in 5 year event. Under the B1 scenario, a 1 in 20 year event would likely become a 1 in 5 year event and a 1 in 10 year event in the northern hemisphere high altitudes. The 1 in 20 year extreme daily maximum temperature that is a value that was exceeded on average only once during the period 1981 to 2000 will likely increase by about 1 degree centigrade to 3 degree centigrade by the mid 21st century and by about 2 degree centigrade to 5 degree centigrade by the late 21st century depending on the region and the emission scenario. The Indian Meteorological Department's National Data Center made available to me exclusively the criterion for heat waves or cold waves. I'm going to read it out now. Heat wave criteria for heat wave. Heat wave need not be considered till maximum temperature of a station reaches at least 40 degrees for the plains and at least 30 degrees for hilly regions. When normal maximum temperature of a station is less than or equal to 40 degrees centigrade, there is a heat wave. Departure from a normal is 5 to 6 degrees centigrade. Severe heat wave is departure from normal to 7 degrees centigrade or more. When normal maximum temperature of a station is more than 40 degrees centigrade, it is a heat wave. That is a departure from the normal is 4 degrees to 5 degrees centigrade. Severe heat wave is departure from normal by 6 degrees centigrade or more. When actual maximum temperature remains 45 degrees centigrade or more, irrespective of normal maximum temperature, heat wave should be declared. Hot day, whenever maximum temperature remains 40 degrees centigrade or more and minimum temperature is 5 degrees centigrade or more above normal, it may May be defined as hot day provided it is not satisfying the heat wave criteria given above. Criteria for describing hot day for coastal stations. When maximum temperature departure is 50 degree, 5 degrees centigrade or more from normal, a hot day may be described irrespective of the threshold value of 40 degrees centigrade.
If the threshold value of 40 degrees centigrade is reached, heat wave may be declared. Criteria for cold wave. The actual minimum temperature of a station should be reduced to wind chill effective minimum temperature for WCTN based on wind chill factor using the enclosed table enclosure 1, WMO that is the World Meteorological Organization number 331 but slash tech note number 123 on the assessment of the human bioclimate, uh, climate, uh, the assessment of human bioclimate, a limited review of physical parameters 1972 for declaring cold wave and cold day WCTN that is wind chill effective minimum temperature should only be used if W CTN is 10 degrees centigrade or less, then only the conditions for cold waves should be considered. When normal minimum temperature is equal to 10 degrees, when the normal minimum temperature is equal to 10 degrees centigrade or more, cold wave departure from normal is minus 5 to minus 6 degrees. Severe cold wave departure from normal is minus 7 degrees or less. When normal minimum temperature is less than 10 degrees centigrade, cold wave departure from the normal is minus 4 degrees to minus 5 degrees centigrade. Severe cold wave departure from the normal is minus 6 degrees centigrade or less. When the wind chill factor is 0 degrees or less, cold wave should be declared irrespective of normal minimum temperature of the station. However, this criteria is not applicable for those stations whose normal minimum temperature is below 0 degrees centigrade. Cold day, when the maximum temperature is less than or equal to 16 degrees centigrade in the plains, it will be declared cold day. Cold wave conditions for coastal stations. For coastal stations, the threshold value of minimum temperature of 10 degrees centigrade is rarely reached. However, the local people feel discomfort due to wind chill factor which reduces the minimum temperature by a few degrees depending upon the wind speed. The cold day concept may be used following the criteria given below, that is actual minimum temperature of a station be reduced to the wind chill factor, that is I think the wind chill light temperature factor. This WCTN, that is the wind chill light temperature factor, should be used to declare cold wave or cold day. When minimum temperature departure is minus 50 degrees, sorry, sorry, sorry. When minimum temperature departure is 5 degrees centigrade or less over a station, or a cold day may be described irrespective of threshold value of 10 degrees centigrade. However, when the threshold of 10 degrees centigrade is reached, a cold wave can be declared. When a station satisfies both the cold wave and the cold day criteria, then cold wave has a higher priority and has to be declared. Heat wave or cold wave and hot day or cold day are very specific phenomena. Therefore, they are described for a met sub meteorological subdivision or a part thereof when at least two stations satisfy the criteria. Okay. And that is all for today. Tonight. We have covered blizzards and cyclones in depth in tonight's video that is meant for 9th of April 2022. In the next week's video, we will cover cloudbursts, mudslides, and landslides and coastal incursion on the 10th of April 2022. And there will be no live interaction till the end of this chapter's book reading. Until next week's video, take care, keep smiling, stay home, stay safe. Ciao!